Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Coulter, for this, um, you know, invitation. Um, I feel absolutely honored uh, being here with you today. I want to thank Dr. Cesar Castillo for no, nominating me. And I always, uh, you know, think that Dr. Castillo is the most noble colleague I ever have met in my career. Um, I'm a proud brown immigrant of Colombia and American citizen, and I absolutely bless in our institution, including the Baylor College of Medicine, Baylor Santos Medical Center, and uh, THI. I was born in Cartagena, beautiful city. If one day you can visit, please do so. The only thing I want to remind you for your cultural awareness, you, you should actually write it as it's Colombia, not Colombia. That will be a good tip whenever you visit my lovely city. So I'm inspired to present this lecture because I, I do believe that the, the patients and healthcare improvement need timely delivery of valuable clinical knowledge and prevention of, of errors at the point of care. And you will see how critical care echocardiography fits in that category. My conflict of interest uh, includes that I actually, the anesthesiology designated seat within the Society of Critical Care Medicine. I do represent the society with the National Board of Echocardiography, as well as the SCCM at the American Society of Echocardiography and the Joint Commission for um, Cardiac Center Certifications. I have been challenged uh, over the last decade, and this, this picture you see how I actually engaged in a, a serious discussion with a very prominent surgical intensivist in the United States because he was probably you know, skeptical about the value of critical care echocardiography. So I, I'm pretty comfortable you know, doing this lecture and engage any of my colleagues within Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center to discuss more about this. I will going to be using my favorite book uh, that I have read over the last uh, five years to justify why critical care echocardiography should be a priority for each of you, especially the cardiology trainees. I will going to explain first what, what is critical care echocardiography when you use it, and more importantly, half of the presentation, I will justify why uh, it is important. So, this is the first uh, definition for critical care echocardiography back in 2013 by the person who trained me at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Dr. Aki Oren Greenberg. And as you can see in this definition, it's pretty much the utilization of echocardiography and in cardiovascular, cardiocirculatory and respiratory failure. You can repeat it. And as you can see here, it's very clear that this is for emergent problems in a critical care setting. The same year, there was this uh, controversial publication by the American Society of Echocardiography. This publication actually was uh, led by cardiologists, and they were trying to make a contrast between limited TTE and focused cardiac ultrasound. I have several presentations in, in Europe specifically, and oh my God, uh, I, I encountered very tough discussion with the Europeans because they disagree with this. Uh, and basically they were undermining the utilization of pockets at the bedside and pretty much, you know, leaving them um, apart. So over the last decade, uh, with those two definitions and the previous one by Dr. Aki Orin Greenberg, we have been using all these uh, wide range of devices. And in this picture was in my previous institution. She was a cardiology fellow and pulmonary critical care fellow. I was educating both of them. So it doesn't matter which device you have. It doesn't matter the definition. What matters is how you're going to be using at the bedside. And that's what I will make emphasis now. So within the Society of Critical Care Medicine, we really were committed to see how this concept of critical care echocardiography try to equate at least the level of cardiology with limited TT. That was the goal. So those definitions of focused cardiac ultrasound or even focused cardiac critical care echocardiography were left behind. And now we were more focused how we really can raise the standard. So you can see I am an anesthesiologist intensivist, and you can see here all my applications for the tool. It can, I can be called from the AD to evaluate a patient that's going to the OR in the pre-anesthesia office. It can be in the PACU, it can be in the CVICU or even the general surgery ward on, inside the OR. So early in my career, I was very interested in seeing how the tool can be utilized across the board. So in this study, I was able to demonstrate that regardless you are a cardiovascular anesthesia fellow, critical care uh, physician, even 
even nurse practitioner anesthesi or general anesthesiologist, you still can actually uh, learn basic skills in, in focused cardiac uh, ultrasonography. Later in 2018, we actually were trying even to uh, propose that even one view might equate the three you know, conventional views with transthoracic echo. We were able actually to see up to 80% of the patients when we were evaluating them with only the subcostal view. And that's the reason this mnemonic came up at the echocardiographic assessment using subsidy only view, the easy uh, exam. And just this year, we were able actually to uh, publish, you know, with the uh, Canadian Journal of Anesthesiology that uh, it's, it's going in that direction, that we need to identify what is that entry point for any novice in our specialty. So you can see how uh, all these definitions, all this transition, trying to facilitate the learning and the teaching to the trainee has been important for us over the last decade. Perhaps this might be a, a, a moment to have a pause. What is the situation? We have two distinct scope of practice here. We have cardiologists, echocardiographists that mainly work in the echo lab. They are experts in structural assessment and it's disease oriented, you know, uh, approach. And they don't need to have that immediate, you know, integration to the, to, to the clinical context. In contrast, we have intensivists which actually uh, has to be at the bedside all the time. We need to incorporate those uh, physiologic parameters and other even diagnostic uh, uh, you know, modalities. And we are using the tool even for the screening, diagnostic or monitoring purpose. But the most important thing is that we need to take immediate decisions. And that actually, that was what inspired me to put in the first three lines of this uh, review article with the New England Journal of Medicine, stating that the immediate clinical integration is actually what contrasts that scope of practice from an intensivist and radiologist or, or cardiologist. And I think this is a good first step to have that mutual respect and recognition that the tool can be applicable for both scenarios, but they are not actually exclusive. And this is my personal uh, uh, fra conceptual framework of critical care echocardiography. I do believe, uh, you know, overall ultrasonography in clinical medicine, uh, you, you have application of ultrasonography in other areas, in obstetrics or even space medicine, et cetera. Then my scope of practice as an intensivist being at the bedside is important. So the point of care ultrasonography is a necessary skill set for me as an intensivist. Inside that point of care ultrasonography, we acknowledge that critical care echocardiography will include that advanced, advanced level of skills to actually do the proper assessment. As you can see here, I include both TTE and TE. Why? Well, I will tell you later why, but it's an expectation that we are forming a half a dozen of individuals with the Beirut Salud Medical Center for the LVAD and the heart transplant service with one six anesthesiologist intensivists who actually can have both diplomat, uh, you know, certifications with the National Board of ECHO because the complexity of the patient we deal with on a daily basis. So when are you going to do that? Well, this is kind of the new paradigm. You can see here how you can start using POCUS just to do a screening, uh, have a sense what's going on. Sometimes even it can be adjunct to the to the physical exam, but when, you want, when we never we want to do a diagnosis, whenever we want a diagnostic, uh, you know, application, then we need to incorporate here critical care echocardiography and comprehensive echo. This actually has been uh, documented uh, in the in the literature. And then, lastly, whenever you want to use as a monitor, this is a different level because. When you are using a monitor, you are gonna need quantitation. You need quantitation, you need to be exceedingly experienced in this specific skill. So you can see here, whenever I'm applying critical care echocardiography as a monitoring tool, it's the maximal usefulness because you probably even, you can do the same monitoring you do with a swan guns with echocardiography, but then that's the maximal usefulness. You are avoiding a, an invasive procedure, but you need maximal experience. And I'm very serious about this. So I was exposed uh, early in my career 
to see this huge, you know, um, um, frame um, um, in my previous institute, my first institution at Cleveland Clinic. And as you can see here, it was a high state situation. Uh, they, they really are a high reputable, you know, team in the entire world. I, I was absolutely blessed being there as well. And um, 2009, they built this new, uh, actually, a hospital that was only dedicated to uh, cardiovascular uh, medicine and, and lung transplantation. And I, I was very active in, in, in this unit. And I will tell you, I was lucky because that beginning in my career was actually what put me in the spot. I know a cardiologist, okay? I know an anesthesiologist. And I'm dealing, I'm, I'm actually associated with cardiology fellows that most of them were chief residents elsewhere and I have prominent cardiologists, prominent cardiothoracic surgeons. What, what does it mean? Well, it means that that year in 2009, my second kid was born, but at the same time, the nurses said, I have little Jose. I was beginning my career. I started, you know, going to examine each of my patients with CX50 machine that I loved. And then one night at 3 a.m. in the morning, I actually was able to rescue a patient that I couldn't do a TE. T was kind of the standard of whatever badness in the ICU was. But in this case, using transthoracic echo actually saved this patient that have a colis knees and proceed. As you know, I kind of put a T pro if you had this, this case. And uh, Dr. Rice was, uh, Thomas Rice, who's a very prominent thoracic surgeon in America, actually was very grateful that uh, we saved this patient's life. So uh, during that year, that was so much fun. This was a patient that was transferred from the MICU to the CVICU, 2 a.m. in the morning. That was uh, year 2010. Uh, they, they needed an ECMO. All the ECMOs were in our unit. So guess what? And I, I'm saving this, this um, clip because at the time, I was not able actually to put my clips in the medical record. I was not allowed. This is actually a clip that was recorded with my iPhone. And for those that are not that familiar with that, with this kind of uh, uh, ultrasonography, you can see how there is a effusion around the lung, and then end of the story, we drain that 1.7 liters sequentially in both hemithorax, and within five hours, the patient is back in the MICU. Of course, next day, everybody has to be saying like, wow, how this happened? Imagine you put this morbid obese patient in an ECMO where you, know, you, you were able to abort it. So these are uh, anecdotes. But the anecdotes actually might be really well justified by studies like this one that, by the way, was published in our anesthesiology journal since 2004. And you can see how the chest radiography uh, underperforms when you compare that with lung ultrasonography. No question. So I can always challenge mo most of uh, my, my colleagues uh, regarding the identification of pleural effusion with lung ultrasonography. There is no question about that. Later on, um, I've been uh, in the past doing some percentage of neurocritical care and even the neurointensivists, they still believe that the, the tool doesn't have actually a role um, in the management of the patients. Think about it. People who have a stroke has cardiovascular disease. It's very prevalent. So I have these patients that are coming for care or uh, of, uh, um, 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 thrombo thrombo thrombectomies in acute ischemic stroke, but they had the comorbidity. So they want us to manage those patients just with conscious sedation, and they don't have a clue whether the patient have a VS of 20% bilateral pleural effusion. Those patients were crashing in the angel suite. So I engaged, you know, a strong leader like Paul Bespa from UCLA in this regard and inspired the neurointensivists to do that. In this other study, I team up with a a very respected young uh, cardiologist intensivist at uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And we now started integrating lone ultrasound with cardiac ultrasound for the cardiac ICU because the cardiologists were not that actually, uh, you know, updated on lone ultrasonography, especially integrating that with echocardiography. Or even now we have nephrologists that are intensivists and are demonstrating the value of critical care echocardiography. In this case, actually, they are telling them, hey, listen, uh, we can do advanced cardio, uh, critical care echocardiography. Look at all these parameters in echocardiography. They are proposing to do, this is advanced critical care echo, and this is actually coming from a nephrologist intensivist. So, and this is to distinguish the different 
kind of shot. Show me in any of the current uh, classification for shock how a person that, who is not a cardiologist is proposing this. So the last three examples are showing you that the tool is not, is not inherent to any specific specialty or any specific patient population. The tool actually is for any medical specialist or even generalist who wants to use it, regardless is even in the field, uh, it, it can be even in rural area, it can be a paramedic, there is recent evidence of that. So um, I'm, I'm now showing you how over the last decade, we have made a significant progress in the utilization of critical care echo. In this review that I participated with colleagues from different continents, we came out with this a, and it's sequential. And the most important one on the top, the number one, you can see every new trainee should be able to perform a basic critical care echo. But the second one, there is no excuse for any patient who becomes hypotensive to not have this evaluation. And then we go so on, and you can see even here, we're just even saying that the TE Pro should be in the ICU. So this is a consensus. This is a consensus on mounting evidence for critical care echocardiography. But now is the most important part of the lecture. I want to engage you. What is the reason I became so, so reluctant to change my practice? And I do believe that any intensivist moving forward must always have the skill set in critical care echocardiography. This is one of our leaders in the country, Dr. Fink say this, stated this in 2015. The technical skill set that is required to be a fully competent intensivist has expanded as well. We expect proficiency, proficiency in ultrasound and echocardiography, a diagnostic and interventional tools. You, you are seeing airway management and you are seeing extracorporeal support. Dr. Fink actually is a surgical intensivist and that actually inspired me five years ago. I do believe that what you have a better and look with our group in our critical care section. So we are committed to have advanced beginner, everybody in my team, everybody in our team, including the nurse practitioners, should be at this level on critical care echocardiography. However, as a program director of the fellowship in anesthesia critical care, our fellows want to be at least competent, most likely proficient. And if somebody wants to go to the next level, they should be experts. But this is a commitment from the leadership perspective that our trainees has to be at that level. So if we want to really take better care of our patients, it cannot be only one person. And the competence actually includes having the right technology, having that political alignment, and have the collective learning. And that's the reason we need to be inclusive and we need to actually train anybody from any a specific background, including even respiratory therapies. What if I have in the future respiratory therapists telling me I have, I have failed to actually wean this patient from the ventilator, but I'm seeing here with ultrasound, you have a, a major atelectasis. So we created a certification pathway and we are very, very fortunate to be successful a few years back. What, but what does it mean that you are critical care echocardiography certifying in this specific field. Well, that means that you know how to obtain, you know how to obtain the images and you interpret them. I'm not talking about just passing the test. I have seen people who have passed the test, they struggle obtaining the views. But when you have the critical care echocardiography certification, that implies that you should be able to actually acquire the images and interpret the image in the clinical context. Why this was needed? Because we needed a formal assessment to prove that expertise in every domain that requires that integration of the cognitive and the motor skills. And by the way, that includes the, the wide breadth of pathophysiology in critical care medicine. So if I work in a unit that has a patient with LBATS transplantation, I better make sure that actually that is included in this certification. So these are the purpose of the critical care echocardiography certification. Um, 
once again, uh, establish that domain. Uh, we need to really demonstrate the level of knowledge. And we really want to enhance over time the quality and individual uh, professional growth in this field. And we want to recognize those individuals who are doing this very seriously. And lastly, we need to continue serving the public by encouraging high quality patient care in the practice of critical care echocardiography. So here I'm making a contrast between basic knowledge and advanced knowledge. The critical care echocardiography certification includes advanced knowledge. And you can see here how actually is defined a comprehensive hemodynamic and cardiac evaluation. You need to demonstrate that competency in all ICU patients. You should be able to do differential diagnosis. You should be able to do quantitative measurement. You actually will be introduced to TEE. So that's when you consider yourself that you are competent in critical care echocardiography. How to apply to this certification? Well, first of all, you should be able to demonstrate that you are practicing as a critical care provider. So this is for individuals that are able to demonstrate they have certain amount of hours working in, in an ICU. Even if you are a general cardiologist or even if you are a general anesthesiologist, as soon as you are able to demonstrate, you spend hours with critical ill patients. The eligibility, you can see here, you pass the exam. If you have done the ASCO exam in the past, you need a medical license. You have your certification in your specialty and training, as, as I told you, as I told you, experience in critical care. And then some training or experience in critical care echo. More importantly, you need these numbers for studies. And this is a good opportunity to thank all cardiology fellows and cardiac sonographers um, under the you know, leadership of Nofel and Dr. Steinbach for allowing my anesthesia critical care fellows to be there. And you have been extremely helpful to them. Both of my fellows are actually over 100 studies now. And it is our goal by June, they have the 150 studies. I want them to lead by example, wherever they go. So going to which evidence, because this is, this is the problem. Uh, I've, I've been stopped by people. What is the evidence for that, Jose? I'm seeing all of you guys have been doing this, but what is the evidence? Well, if I take this, this study from almost like a decade ago, uh, they just basically were scanning people from head to toe. And of course, when you scan, you're gonna have findings, but I will tell you almost 80% of the new findings were cardiothoracic abnormalities. You can see here how long ultrasonography and cardiac ultrasonography were important. And of course, that will lead to changes in the medical therapy. And, and in terms of invasive procedures, the more prevalent was actually the drainage of uh, pleural effusions. So things has been changing in regard of uh, which specialty are becoming more active on the uh, academic productivity. You can see here how over the last five years has been a tremendous revolution tremendous explosion in the number of publications related to critical care echocardiography or cardiac point of care ultrasound. And you can see here all the domains, including cardiovascular structure and function, technique, balance status, cardiac arrest, and medical education, for instance. But look at this. Just this past year, we were able to see how my background specialty of critical care and anesthesiology is actually kind of increased in comparison than a decade ago. So a decade ago was more prominent actually with your specialty of cardiology. And then now there are more anesthesiologists, more intensive, more emergency medicine physicians being more prolific. And that this is important because you need to be aware of that application outside your um, cardiovascular uh, you know, floors. Furthermore, CMS, now includes ultrasonography evaluation, even in the management of patients with septic shock and sepsis is there. It's actually an alternative to the physical exam. In addition to it, some institution has developed robust database and the MIMIC-3 actually is a database and you know, associated with the hardware system is a tremendously uh, you know, um, resource for critical care echocardiography. I have to say that Antoine Villar-Baron 
uh, who I will speak about him later, participated actually. And I, I was quite surprised because they, they, they brought people from the different parts in the world. But look at what happened here. Patients with sepsis, septic shock, when they did uh, this propensity score matched, match the mortality rates for TTE and not TTE in the first 24 hours of admission to the hospital. Actually, the mortality was lower whenever you do a TTE. So we have been trying to facilitate how we can apply this in septic shock. And then here we created that some specific phenotypes. That was from the work in 2018 with anesthesiology residents. Well, the following year, Antoine Velarbaro again, who is a cardiologist intensivist who, who worked in Paris and he was trained in cardiography in the United States, has been working in this field for two decades now. He actually did the study very well done, but utilizing TEE. And now he has these phenotypes. And these phenotypes will have different management if you are septic. Once again, a very active, a very active field in the research of critical care echocardiography. So I put this book chapter because once again, um, the, the amount of evidence that are that is available related to right ventricular function and critical care echocardiography is not that much. But I'm being absolutely fascinated to uh, kind of make a correlation between whatever quantitation and qualitative assessment because um, the importance to do the proper screen. So I have the, the opportunity to work with Antoine Villar Baron, a um, couple of publications in M mode, and then in this specific role, I consider him the most respected individual in, in the planet when it's related to right ventricular dysfunction. So we came up with actually these uh, qualitative assessment. And, and I know that some echocardiologists don't, do not believe in the moderate dysfunction of the right ventricle. Even if you want to do that, it's fine. But even just distinguish, being able to distinguish or contrast normal from severe right ventricular uh, dysfunction, that will be important. I haven't stopped that there. Uh, I think uh, uh, in the coming year, you will see a high profile publication um, that um, we are working on with Dr. Raymond Steinbach and um, um, another uh, national respected uh, cardiac sonographer. So more to follow regarding the right ventricular dysfunction. So what I'm going now to show you is how things become more complex. So we have oftentimes patients with LBAD or right uh, or uh, heart transplantation, and we know the right ventricular dysfunction is there, underlying. But why did they become septic? And then I, I have seen a little bit of, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes hard to really come together as a team when you have some beliefs, and the other especially has uh, another belief. But let me tell you why sometimes we, we cannot be in the same page. You see how, how you are presenting this data. So Antoine Baron uh, recently uh, presented this data on, on right ventricular failure in septic shock. And you can see here how he, had, he has three groups. He had this group of people that actually, there was no right ventricular enlargement, but the CVP was all over the place. And this group two, there was an enlargement and, and the CVP was trying to probably even not be in the high side. But more importantly, the only group that actually he was able to demonstrate that that group of patients did not need more fluids were patients who have a CVP higher than A with RB enlargement. But this graphic is telling you how you have been trained. If you have been trained only on CVP and following SWAN numbers is one thing. My, my suggestion is we might be open to actually have both modalities together we will serve better our patients with that approach. As you can see here, once again, we do this test oftentimes, the passive lead race uh, test. And you can see here how, as you become more enlarged in the right ventricle, you are not that actually responsive to passive leg, uh, passive leg race. And this is the right way to do it. We have, we published this, uh, this past year, please try to take a look of this, um, a review article um, 
on dosing fluids in early septic show, how to do it. They will explain you there. It's very important because something I've been advocating to the team is before you just give empirically 500 cc's of albumin, whatever, why don't do a passive blood raising? Of course, we have been able to demonstrate that if indiscriminate am amount of fluids is harmful to the patient. In that, in that study, by the way, there was no evidence of the TAPSI being discriminatory and patients were gonna respond or not to fluids. That's, that's an important finding. So what are those active areas of research right now? Well, there is, um, there is a lot going on on the cardiac arrest prognostication. They wanna see whether if we do um, a critical keratocardiography during cardiac arrest, I can prognosticate that's something you have to be vigilant of. Second, very popular, uh, there, are, there is interest to de-resuscitate patients, meaning after we have been so good resuscitating them, how we can take out fluids. And lastly, this is our area of mechanical circulatory support, how we can manage those patients better with critical keratocardiography. Now, this paper last year, um, like 95%, 90 8% of the um, authors were from, from Europe, only Paul Mayo was there. Uh, it's showing you how we're becoming more strict when it's coming to um, um, conducting um, critical care echocardiography studies. So this panel is proposing now that these are actually the parameters has to be included in the evaluation of LB systolic function, okay? And for right ventricular function, same thing, they will tell you. And for diastolic dysfunction and for fluid management. Why I mentioning this? It's very possible that you submit a study regarding the management of patients with critical care echo. They were gonna make this paper as a reference how your methodology can be better validated if you follow those parameters that I was including here. So. I just wanted you to have a reference this paper because I'm seeing how even, even though it's a panel, as, as per panel opinion, uh, it makes sense because we are trying to elevate um, uh, the, the, the importance of the methodology on, 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 this, on these studies. And I welcome that for sure. So regarding the fluid um, resuscitation, you can see here all the consequences for fluid overload. I'm pretty sure you, most of you as cardiologists are probably very aware of this, but we, we, for those who are um, working in, in surgical ICU, we know actually how we can create problems in the GI tract or even patients who have abdominal wall um, you know, defect as well. In respiratory for us is a big deal um, regarding, you know, difficult weaning, work of breathing. So this is something that is very important. So what's that happened? Well, I will tell you, um, this is just a very schematic representation how when you become fluid overloaded, your radiatal pressure increases, but these actually are the Doppler imaging in the hepatic vein, the portal vein, and the intrarenal vein uh, vessels just to, to see how you actually have evidence that that's happening. I applaud those efforts. I think this will be something that should be you know, appreciated. Indeed, this publication has shown you here how to do it. And guess what? We actually are doing it. This is actually one of my wonderful fellows, very skillful uh, pulmonary critical care fellow. And actually, without disclosing any patient information here, even look at, and uh, I have to thank Dr. Sanusi for, because his advocacy on, on the, in this regard. It's all good. This is, this is the, the first step creating studies, potential studies that might actually be a good hypothesis for the future. So we're already doing this at Baylor St. Louis Medical Center. What is the problem? The problem is that I have people who can ask me, what is the evidence? Well, the, the honest answer is 
We don't have that much evidence yet. So this is good starting point. I want you just to be aware of, of, of this progress and the research agenda. I think the fluid tolerance is up there. We're going to continue producing that. I want to uh, show you here uh, that actually in the past, um, I used to um, utilize um, pig hearts to really demonstrate the trainees how actually the ultrasound beam dissect the heart, okay? And then now, and even I needed to use the ASE videos, like in this case, so they can understand. Uh, this is one of my former fellows that was actually a previous um, attending here at Baylor St. Lux, and he's an neurointensivist now, University of Florida. But the problem is now, I just recently started a collaboration with a dear Colombian friend, in the University of Minnesota, and now what they are, this is a case of a patient actually who have a, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and needed heart transplantation. So when that patient actually um, underwent heart transplantation, they were able actually to do this ex vivo MRI. And based on this MRI, and ex vivo, you actually can have a 3D printer and have those models from uh, pathologic hearts for the education. What that means, look at now. I have it actually here at home. I have it with me here right now. See? So I don't have now to do any dissection of big hearts. I have actually hearts with pathology. And with that, I will be able to even teach much better my trainees. They, they actually can see these in modules online. So this is a wonderful collaboration. And I hope they are coming. Um, workshop what we do with the cardiovascular anesthesia fellowship and the critical care medicine fellowship um i might bring my my colleagues from the university of minnesota and we'll do something fun with this um you know technology so what is our current stewardship so i, I i'm committed to call it the guidelines for the proper use of uh cardiac ultrasonography uh, for uh, critically ill patients. As you can see here in 2016, the, those were the last guidelines. And I can tell you with all this research agenda, it's, it's, the, the landscape is, is very transformational. So this is time the society try every five years to do a new guidelines. And I, I, I feel absolutely honored to, to lead these guidelines with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Sarah Nikra with um, University of Washington in Seattle. From the personal perspective, uh, I'm pursuing uh, right now my healthcare quality master with John Hopkins. And I was um, very lucky to um, interact with Dr. Uh, Newman Tucker, uh, who was one of the professors. And I'm very interested in really mitigate those diagnostic errors with POCUS. Uh, I think we even can change the terminology and talk about diagnostic difficulties. But this is a new uh, framework, a new understanding about how you have diagnostics, uh, process failure, diagnostic label failure. And this is probably complex at this time for you to understand, but definitely uh, the medication errors were the importance for preventing harm on patients in the last decade. But moving forward, the diagnostic errors are becoming more important. And in fact, there is a society in diagnostic, uh, you know, uh, and diagnostic medicine. So it, this is uh, right now one of my priorities in my career. And I'm collaborating with uh, another colleague from clinic, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Sig Dugar. And I hope uh, we can have uh, something out there uh, published by next year. So I want to thank you for the invite. This is a picture of mine in 1974. My man said that I always was fascinated with medicine. That picture in 2001 was my first fellowship in critical care medicine. I repeated both my fellowship and my residence in the United States. And the picture in 2017 is because I really worked hard to uh, empower the um, intensivists to have the TE probe in the ICUs, and we develop uh, advanced course in TE within the SCCM. 
So I just show him with these three pictures that once again, um, nobody will change my mind regarding the importance of serving our patients better, having higher standards of qualification in critical care echocardiography. Thank you so much.